So it's a pleasure to be here um, to really tell you a story about how far we've come over the last dozen years. And it has an unwritten finish. So I'm hoping that by visiting all of you today that you can become part of the script of talking about extending SETI into the near-infrared wavelengths. So I'm working with a small team, and this was the same team, many of the key members that were part of the optical study mission a dozen years ago, which I'll talk about today, um, as well as new players and new students and new postdocs that I'll highlight through today's talk. So why near-infrared SETI and why now? Um, as we know from other SETI searches, we really push on whatever our technological ability is of today. So whatever is available today is what really kind of limits our search in communication and transmitting and receiving. And so to really extend SETI beyond the radio into the EM spectrum, you have to look at what the availability of detector technology is. And that's going to be a key mission, I, uh, a key message I have for us today is that we really need um, within the SETI community to pay attention to detector development and how it impacts SETI as a whole. So let's step back and see where we've come from. So after the invention of the laser in 1959, Schwartz and Towns wrote a nature paper um, highlighting that using a laser or a maser would be a fantastic means of communication interstellar, along inter interstellar distances. So if you looked at present day technology in 61 on transmission <coughs> schemes, they had a peak pulse laser at about 100 kilowatts. And if you use the largest telescope of that day, of 200 inch, you could outshine the sun in the optical wavelength by a factor of three. Okay, that's quite remarkable. That's in 1961. So let's fast forward now into today's technology and laser development. So imagine that you want to communicate to N stars that you may think that host life. You can do many different transmission schemes, and there's been many authors that have written about this. But if you use the highest powered laser, which is the NIFS laser at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and if you pulse it at very high time scale, so if you pulse it at nanosecond or picosecond time scales, you get extreme power. So about 10 to the 15 watts. Right? When I use a standard laser pointer, we're talking milliwatts. So this is extremely powerful. If you couple that with the largest ground-based telescope of today, of a 10-meter optical telescope, and you imagine some transmission scheme, you can outshine our sun across the entire optical band pass by a factor of 3,000. So in means of communications along far interstellar distances, this is a fantastic means. Of, of using a laser, and as Schwartz and Towns realized soon after the invention. So you can think about this in different means in transmission. You can think about it in continuous wave laser, would they be broadcasting and continuously sending this signal? Um, that would require a significant amount of power and resources. And for searching for such a signal, we'd have to know this, the specific frequency for which they've sent it. Um, to do this, you would need to scan over that, that frequency space um, to look for that narrow emission line. Amy Raines, a student at Berkeley at the time, did this with Jeff Marcy. They looked at their Keck high res data of 577 stars and tried to look for a narrow emission line that could be a beacon that is um, non-terrestrial or non-astrophysical. The other means of optical study is looking for pulsed lasers. And the premise behind this is that you can maximize the energy per bit you send. So you can make a very powerful beacon. Um, but you need to do this on very short time scales to make a powerful beacon. But as well, you need to get to lower background levels. So as I'll describe through my talk, you know, there's a host of backgrounds within our galaxy, terrestrial, within, our, uh, within the solar system that can cause background emission for this. So in writing this talk, I, I wanted to look at kind of where the telecom industry has come from. And so I went and just picked up their, you know, their 101 undergrad textbook, and I flipped open the page. And here it gave the list of the advantage of free space laser communication on Earth. And I'll list it. So with this, which we, we do so much of today, 
they, they explain that we get high data rates, high transmission security, um, lightweight transmitters and receivers, um, increased portability and deployment across the globe and within our satellites, uh, increased security, which is in, 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 of interest for industrial and defense purposes. And I read this and I thought, oh, this is interesting because these are the exact same reasonings that we use for optical SETI when we think about interstellar communication. In fact, if you go further into that and you think about pulse lasers, again, we, we like this idea because you minimize the transmitter size, you minimize the weight of the receivers, and then you maximize the energy per bit transfer. So if you're trying to s send a signal within it. And as well, if you use a pulse laser, you can detect the signal easily across the entire band path. So at optical wavelengths, when we looked at this, um, signals are only observable when you look at the plane of the Milky Way. So we're looking through the Frisbee disk of the, the Milky Way. We can get that signal out to about 1,000 light years for, for reasons I will describe in a moment. So what are the issues of background signals for pulse lasers? So we want to look for nanosecond pulses, and we needed to make sure that there were no other RF signals that could occur at that time scale. So Andrew Howard and Paul Horwitz wrote a nice paper on this, looking into what are other terrestrial or atmospheric or astrophysical phenomena, and they found that they were all negligible. There really weren't any other signals that we would know at that time scale that could uh, cause a false alarm within our study search. But it turns out within optical SETI detectors that the dominant source of background um, are instrumental backgrounds or spurious detector signals. Um, and this, is, this has been a struggle for optical SETI instruments and is a challenge in future instrumentation as well. And I'm going to spend a fair bit of today's talk talking about this issue. So what did we need to do? We want to detect nanosecond pulses. So we really needed fast response, low noise detectors to be able to do the search. Um, and that's what happened over a decade ago. So we first started our optical SETI programs. Um, once we had those available detectors, we had programs at Harvard um, with Paul Horwitz, Princeton, Columbus, Ohio with Stuart Kingsley. And then we had our groups at Berkeley and the SETI Institute um, develop optical SETI, which I'll describe a little more about, at Leuchner and Lick Observatory, and much more. I've seen pitter patters of news coming over the decade where there's optical setting now in Costa Rica, uh, Italy, Scotland. Um, and the nice aspect of optical SETI is that it's an economical way to search. It's a, they're actually very um, cheap processes to do a search for a SETI search. So optical SETI made use of fast response photomultiplier tubes. Um, these are high bandwidth PMTs. They need to sample this nanosecond regime. Um, PMTs are great at optical wavelengths. They have low noise and they have very high quantum efficiencies, and we were very familiar with them. We had already been working with them for about 50 years in the astrophysical community when we decided to embark this on into optical SETI. But as we quickly learned, the groups learned that we had spurious bright false signals, and this was caused by scintillation in the glass of the PMT, cosmic rays, and then simple Poisson statistics. When you look at bright sources, you have photon pileup or shot noise. So you need multiple PMTs to be placed in coincidence to lower that false detection. And that's what happened. We had um, the first searches um, starting in 97 and 98, and then later at Lick in 2001. We had, they decided to put two PMTs in coincidence. Okay, so they needed to lower the false alarm within it. And then they had the wavelength range of about 350 to 900 nanometers. So we're covering the whole optic, optical bandpass, and all we're looking for is that bright beacon. And then Harvard at Paul Horwitz um, developed an all-sky optical SETI instrument to try to look for this as well. But there was a problem. Even with two detectors, that wasn't enough to solve those issues of having false spurious signals. And so in 2001, our team developed a triple photometer system to re reduce the false alarm rate. And you can see um, some of the group members there on, the, on your right, and on the left, you have the tr three photomultiplier tubes that are in just a small detector housing. And I want to talk about this a little bit because it's going to become important when I talk about our new instrumentation and, and what we're doing. So I just want us to have this um, in our arsenal when we discuss this. So 
this was a, a diagram or cartoon diagram of how our three photomultiplier system <clears throat> worked. And this was at the Leuchner telescope. So on the top left, you have Leuchner, which is a 30 inch telescope. And then that light gets split into three PMTs or three detectors. And then you have a discriminator, which is in purple. And that sets a threshold for the number of photons that you discriminate against. And then from that, you basically now are just counting photons. And then you go into a coincidence board logic, which are, it was in green, and you count whether they are in coincidence with pairs of detectors or triples of detectors. And then you simply record the data and analyze it. This is very primitive in some respects. It's a very simple analysis. It's a very simple project. Um, we're just recording pulses and over a certain threshold of the number of photons. And then we need to record the number of coincidences between pairs and triple detectors. So here's just a data stream from our LIC system. We have three photomultiplier tubes, PMT1, PMT2, PMT3. And then you can have a coincidence between the pairs. You can see your combinations of that, coincidence one and two, coincidence two, one and three, and coincidence two and three. And then what we consider the holy grail in optical study is all three lighting up at once, which you can see the series of ones down one of the rows which would be our wow movement. Because with three photometers, that would be very unusual to see. So there's no waveform analysis to this. We're just simply counting photons and seeing if they simultaneously arrive at the detector. That's the majority of all of our optical study work is our analysis techniques. So I wanted to describe that to see where we're going with this as well. So a little bit about target selection. Um, unlike Harvard, which was an all-sky survey, LIC was a targeted survey. So we were looking at nearby stars, so at all stars that were within about 200 light years um, that was observable from the nickel within our catalog. And we were looking at solar like, and you can put that in quotes. That's FGKM stars within the main sequence. And we observed about 4,600 of these over a span of five years. Um, we had 10 minutes per star. And then we looked, of course, at that time on all known um, stars with extrasolar planets. And that's remarkable because that was very few comparatively to what we have today. We're talking about 150 known extrasolar planets to now thousands. And so our view of that has changed, which I'll get to within our target selection. So why didn't we do near-infrared astronomy a decade ago? Okay especially since within the SETI community, it was known that this would be a prime region to do a SETI search. So Charlestown wrote a paper in 1983 discussing the different backgrounds that you would have to try to do a, a transmission at these wavelengths and determined that the near-infrared and if not the mid-infrared is one of the best means to do this. That's because of reduced backgrounds in galactic and extragalactic, which I'll show in a minute. Um, again, you're maximi maximizing energy per bit. It's just simple E equals H nu within um, your photon frequency. And then, as I'll describe, it's your decrease in interstellar extinction. That's the real gain if you're trying to communicate within the Milky Way. But the clincher is that we did not, 10 years ago, even five years ago, have the capability to have fast response near infrared detectors with low noise to do this search. Okay. So let's visit some of Charles Town's points here and revisit it many years later. So I like, I like to look at this. This is a spectral energy distribution of a spiral-like galaxy like our own Milky Way. And this is a spectral uh, SED, as I call it, um, from the optical into the infrared or into the mid-infrared. And on the left part, as you, if you cannot read the plot, it shows the optical regime, which we were searching, about 350.3. This is in my, units of microns out to about one micron. And you can see the stellar population within a spiral galaxy peaks. So that's coming from the stellar emission. And then it decreases dramatically as you go into the near infrared and start climbing into the mid infrared. And you see that dip in the middle of the plot of about five microns. And then that's when you start seeing emission from the interstellar medium. And that starts picking up. And you see all of these different features that you can get within your molecules that emit. And if you extend that out, the curve would continue to rise and out into the long infrared wavelengths. So our interest, and Charles Town's interest, 
was that to get into the near infrared, you get into lower background emission from the galaxy to go into this regime. Not only that, you get lower interstellar extinction. And so this is the main point for this, is that if you look at the bottom curve where it's patchy and dark, and you see the optical there, it has absorption from the interstellar medium. And that's a very dramatic ab absorption. And in the top figure, you see the near infrared. We're looking at the plane of the Milky Way. So what I've done here is I've just plotted the percentage of transmission in the ISM if you're looking again through the plane of the Milky Way at different distances. So pay attention to the squares in this curve. And that's one of the middle curves. And that's at a distance of two kiloparsecs. We're about 7,000 light years away. And if you were to communicate at that far interstellar distance, if you look at the optical regime, you basically almost have 0% transmission. It's opaque. You cannot see. So you really need to extend the longer wavelengths into the near infrared or longer to allow that opacity to increase. Okay. So this, I think, is one of the prime reasons if you were to do pulse lasers and to transmit, you would not want that loss of signal and you'd want to move to longer wavelengths. So all, as I'll say, is near-infrared SETI, I think, is ready now. And that's thanks to the telecommunications industry and the defense. So we've had a boom of all of our cell phones, all of our satellite ink, um, uplinks that have dealt with near-infrared lasers and receivers in this, in this realm. The figure I'm showing you here is for um, missile range finding. And so they're interested in fast response near-infrared detectors for this reason. And the detectors that they use are either photomultipliers, which are the similar detectors we use for optical SETI. But the issues with these is that, again, these are single photometers. But for photomultiplier tubes at infrared wavelengths, they have very low quantum efficiency. Although the good part of PMTs is that they had large gains. And so they were easy to work with with our electronics. The other detectors that came online were near-infrared avalanche photodiodes, or APDs, as I'll describe them for the talk. Uh, they are a semiconductor, and they can be read out in different ways, as I'll describe. But they have higher quantum efficiencies at these wavelengths. Um, they typically have lower gains than a PMT um, and smaller active areas, which can make it difficult with optics. The detectors we were interested in exploring were cooled in-gas APDs. So in this near-infrared range here from 900 to 1,700 nanometers, and which provided lower noise because it was cooled, and they provided high bandwidth. You can read out APDs and PMTs in two different methods. Um, and these were the methods we were exploring. So at first, we looked into the Geiger method, which we liked because they had large high gain, so they were easy to work with. But when you operate in the Geiger mode with APDs, um, there's large quench times, meaning once a photon comes in, you have to reset the detector. And when you're resetting the detector, that takes time. And these times would be on microseconds, right? That's no good because we're interested in nanoseconds. So we'd kill the duty cycle on sky. Well, then we looked at the linear mode APDs that have no dead time, but very low gains, which means that you need more electronics and it's more difficult to weed out your signal with it. So we're in this area of selecting between Geiger and linear mode. And as our team was looking at it, it was like the neither porridges were the right temperature. Like neither one was good. There was pros and cons. And we were trying to figure out which one would work the best. Um, and we stumbled on this for a while. And in fact, for many years, we monitored over a dozen companies as they were developing commercially available um, in-gas APDs and discussing this with all the engineers at these companies. We then began to narrow down on the new APDs that were emerging on the market that had a different type of readout. And this intrigued us. And so, in November in 2012, I went with a graduate student from Toronto. We flew down to New Jersey and met with two companies that were just starting to say they had these commercially available APDs, met with them, and decided to buy a few of them and take them back to the lab and test them out. 
And these avalanche photodiodes use a readout process called internal discrete amplification. Okay, so it's kind of a mouthful, but the concept actually is not that difficult. So imagine you have a single photometer, and each photometer is like a micron in size, and they put them in an array. So you have many little photometers in it. And so those, that array is then connected to a single anode and a cathode, so it's still a single photometer. But as one of these photometers detects a photon and it quenches and it has that large quench time, the other single micron pixel, as I'll call it, next to it is open and can see it. And so as you have, they've developed this readout signal, they have an array of these single photometers, which are APDs, and then they use a single readout in an anode or cathode. This solved our problem. So it meant that they had a good duty cycle to get down to these nanosecond regimes. They didn't have large quench times, and they had high gains. So it was easier within our electronics. Good news. So we were excited about these. These were very new detectors, um, and so we, it took us a little bit to, to test them out and understand their capabilities. So after several, a uh, couple years of testing at Toronto, um, trying to understand the capabilities of these detectors and seeing how they would fit into a near-infrared SETI experiment, um, we selected them. And I, here's a picture of Jerome Mayer. He was on the cover slide. He's a Dunlop postdoctoral fellow that's been tirelessly working on understanding these detectors um, and characterizing them. So now that we have these in the lab, we had to figure out that question that was plaguing us with that optical SETI experiment. How many detectors do we need? Do we need one detector, two detectors, three detectors? That has to do with the detector itself and how it behaves. So we needed to understand its dark count rate, so how many spurious signals it had, and we needed to understand its sensitivity and its false alarm rate to make this decision. So these are sensitive devices. Um, we operate at high voltage, so they're at the breakdown voltage of that semiconductor. And we've designed our own detector board, which you see on the left here, and our own power supply. So they're, they're sensitive. APDs are sensitive detectors to work with. You have to operate them at low compliance current. Um, Dan Wertheimer and um, Dick Treppers on our team is, has worked on the electronics for, these for our detector here, pictured here. The detector is that tiny little thing. It actually would be almost like the, I should put a pencil right next to it. You can kind of see at the tip of that uh, a screwdriver coming in for scale. So the active area is 200 microns in size, and it sits in a TO5 can. And what is a TO5 can? Well, it's a thermal, electrically cooled can that goes down to a minus 30 degrees Celsius. So we can cool down these detectors to get to the low noise. So what does the data look like? Understanding the dark pulses of these detectors will tell you how many detectors we really need. So this is a data stream. You can see our stream here is in 30 uh, microseconds. We have our voltage here, and then we have all of our dark pulses. Okay. So this, I don't know, this doesn't look good when you first look at it, right, if you're looking for pulses. But don't get too disheartened yet. So if you look at the pulse width and the height of those darks, they're about, the pulse width is about a full of half max of about a half a nanosecond, and darks respond similarly to how the photons would interact with it, so a single electron response in it. So if I had a light pulse here, it would look the same, about a half nanosecond in pulse. Okay. So we need to understand the dark count, but I'm going to take a step back here and just do a very simple problem. Imagine, forget about what type of detector it is, just picture a bucket and you're collecting photons. And you want to understand if you have a greater number of detectors, how you would suppress or partition those photons in those detectors. So if you want a probability, let's say I have two detectors here, which is the more solid curve here. If you have two detectors and you want one photon to land in each of these two detectors, how many photons would it take where you had a 50% probability of that occurring? Okay. If you have three detectors, how many photons would it take to spread that into three detectors and continue on? The point from this 
is that as you increase the number of detectors, you have to increase the number of photons. Okay, your sensitivity goes down. So we have a trade-off to deal with here between the number of photons and the probability of spreading that over detectors and that of the dark rate. So I'm saying the same thing here in the slide, essentially. If I take that curve and I put it in a table format, and remember we can threshold at the different numbers of photons that we say is a detection, and we can choose any number of detectors. So let's look at this. Let's say we want three photons. Okay, that's our threshold. And we have two detectors. We need 6.8 photons to get a 50% probability that that would occur. If you have three photons and you need four detectors, you need 18 photons for that probability to occur. Okay, we're just counting photons and how we partition them into n number of detectors. The point is the more the number of the higher number of detectors, the lower the sensitivity. Yeah, it might be intuitive, but it's good to revisit this while thinking about it. So let's go back and think about our dark pulses. <clears throat> so here's the pulse height distribution of, I say DAPD now because these are the, these internal discrete APDs, so they're, they're somewhat special here. On the vertical axis, I'm gonna show you a few of these plots, are the number of pulses per second above a voltage threshold versus your pulse height in volts, okay? So this follows a power law, and that's all that's telling us is that smaller pulses are more common than bigger pulses. Right, that's, this is what it, this is showing us. But the shape of this pulse height distribution we can use um, in powerful ways to try to look for detections. So this is one APD and just looking at that dark, right, taking that dark sequence and showing that distribution. Now let's put two detectors down. So we wanna trigger our threshold and lower our false alarm rate here. So in blue is one detector one, in yellow or brown is detector two. You can see that we've set some voltage or threshold here, a number of photons or electrons here. And you can see that you would trigger on a coincidence here between each of the detectors, and then you would trigger once on perhaps a noise spike on one of the second detectors. So this is how we would trigger and record a coincidence between the data streams. If you look at that pulse height distribution, so again, on the left, I'm showing you what, just running, running two detectors simultaneously, and I'm showing the darks. I'm showing the number of pulses you see in it. And then on the right, I show the pulse height distribution, which match the color, green and blue here. In, now pay attention to the light blue. The light blue, or cyan, is the probability distribution of the coincidences occurring between those dark pulses. So how common those happen. The pink curve is our theoretical model, and it follows that as we, that's good, we expect that to happen. So another way to see this is in real time. So if you're marching through time, this is what we would see on an oscilloscope if we were doing this. The left and the middle curve shows the dark pulses as they stream through. Um, as you start over right then, you're building up the pulse height distribution. So higher pulses are rare, so you need to observe longer essentially to see them. And the blue, the satellite blue follows the coincidence model that you would see within your distribution. Okay, so this is, everything I've showed you is we're following pulse height distributions of darks, but we're not gonna be looking at darks, we're gonna be looking at stars, we're gonna be on sky, um, and we're looking for pulses. So what does that look like? We're interested too. So we put a near-infrared laser and pulsed it at nanosecond width and split the light and put them simultaneously on both detectors. And as you can see, you get a series of darks there and then very large spikes where the photons were being detected by each detector. So then you can imagine you can set some trigger on those high pulses for detection of those pulses. So this is what the pulse height distribution looks like in this case, now with a background light and a pulse laser light on top of it. So again, the left is two detectors. You can see what I've just showed you in that movie. Uh, similar is the darks, and then you have your large pulses, and then you have your coincidence, our predicted coincidence rate based on knowing that we're pulsing it, right? We know we're pulsing it. So we have our coincidence rate that matches it. 
You can see this again in this movie if you follow in time as we're just observing our pulse laser. The left curve again, it just shows you um, a zoomed in region of our, our pulses coming in. You can see the data stream in a much larger, fatter scale in the middle. And you can see our pulse height distributions with light. You might already start noticing the shapes are slightly different. One thing to point out here is that the light blue curve now no longer matches the pink curve. Okay, so that I purposely plot it that way. So the pink curve matches the dark model, and the cyan curves now include what you would get with pulse laser. So you can see that immediately your distributions are different. So what's the answer to all this? Why have I been showing this to you? I'm partly telling the story of how, we, how we've gotten to our selection, but it also gets into how we do signal processing. So the question is one versus two detectors. Our team scratched our heads about this for a long time. It turns out we wanted to do both. And the reason is one detector is more sensitive. You don't have to go back to just splitting up all your photons into N detectors. If you don't have to split them up, then, and you can send them all to one detector, that's great. And if you can understand this pulse height distribution and it's consistent with it, then one detectors will always win. If you know what you're looking at and understand your detector, you can discriminate against spurious signals. But there is unknowns. We haven't run this detector for thousands and thousands of hours. We haven't taken it to the telescope yet and observed all these variable sources that we're interested in. And we don't know if there's gonna be that rare spurious event that we may want to discriminate against. So we then decided we needed a second detector in our instrument to have that protocol, um, and especially if we're looking maybe at brighter sources. How we get away with this is by now digitizing the signal and being able, be able, being able to do post-processing, which we had not been able to do in previous optical study searches. Okay, so I've done a lot of talk about detectors, and now let's see what the instrument looks like. But I wanted to explain how we got to two detectors, especially if you knew history of optical study and we spent all that time saying we needed three. <laughs> all right, so we have the telescope on the right, the light's coming down, and it hits a dichroic, and a dichroic can just split different wavelength regimes different directions. So the dichroic sends the, to the right, the optical light into a guide camera that helps us track and actually takes, we'll take pictures in real time to know where we're pointing. The near infrared light gets sent down and then we have a translation stage that could either move in a calibration source, that's our pulse laser, so we can verify our instrument and calibrate it and check for alignment. We then have a filter wheel, this is new for optical study as well. We have a filter wheel and then the light continues through the filter wheel and then we have a translation stage that can then say, I'm gonna move in a beam splitter and I wanna use two detectors, or I can move it away and just use one detector. So we have this flexibility. And then all of our processing is done with a very fast oscilloscope, a two and a half gigahertz scope. Um, and we can do different things with that as I'll describe. So the other parameters, uh, as I said, it's 950 to 1650 nanometers. We can do that all simultaneously. We're using these discrete avalanche photodiodes um, at, with a 200 micron active area, right? That's the whole area. There's all those sub little micron size photometers inside it. Um, we have a half nanosecond pulse width. And then the filters we chose are Y and J. Um, these are interesting for astrophysical reasons, maybe even calibration reasons. Um, and then we have neutral density filters for very bright sources. And then we can observe the full band pass. This will be installed on the one meter nickel telescope at Lick Observatory, where we can see it walking outside right now. Each detector will have 11 arc seconds field of view, and we can stop that down if we want to for background reasons. So here's our optomechanical layout. Uh, I will show in the, the lights coming in from the top left. You have that translation stage, a dichroic, and then the guide camera on the bottom left. And then you can see if the light sent to the right, you have the filter wheel, and then you have a beam splitter into the two of the detectors. You can see this in a different way here where the light's coming down from the telescope and just had uh, attached to our telescope and sent into all of those components. Better yet, you can see it here where we have all of the components assembled 
Um, we've made special efforts to design the whole thing, besides the detector and the detector electronics, to be off-the-shelf components to be economical and easy for duplication. So we were concerned about alignment. This is 200 microns in size, and we were concerned about that. And so we decided to do our first machining on plywood to make sure that all of our calculations were correct. Um, so we did just that. That's why it's seen on a wood board here. We've assembled it. We've attached it. And first try, we were fully aligned. It was fantastic. Um, Patrick Dorville was an undergraduate. Um, at Toronto, he's worked hard on developing the software to control all the instrument components like filter wheels and shutters. And it's a more complex instrument than we've embarked on on previous optical study. Um, he has fully functional GUIs that run all of the instrument. Here is now the instrument fully constructed and machined. Here's, and you can see that attachment that you originally saw within our diagram. It's about the size of a TV tray. You can imagine if you're um, or a little bit of little of the, st the podium here for scale. And then all covered up, we just have a simple cover that comes down and goes over the instrument. Just last week, we've um, assembled all of the electronics. All of our cables are working. So we're going to be running this. In fact, one of our challenges was that we wanted to bring all the control computers into a control room. So we needed to run all of our cables about 75 to 80 feet. So we needed to confirm that you know, our instrument functioned with, that, with these large cables. So all of this was assembled just last week, and everything is working and, and doing great and humming along. So getting back to signal detection and um, post-analysis, we're using these 2.5 gigahertz oscilloscopes for processing and detection. Um, our standard operation would be to trigger on either one or two detectors, as I'll describe, as I described. Once we have a coincidence, we automatically record the waveform to both detectors or one in whichever mode we're observing. And then we have the capabilities to be even more flexible. And on different time bins and time resolutions, we can save the entire waveform and do post-processing analysis to look through periodicities, low signals. Um, we can do full pulsite distribution comparisons. Um, and this is exciting for astrophysical sources that we may want to look at. So getting back to pulsite distributions, uh, this is just showing a comparison of that. So in black, you have just a pure dark of a single APD. In blue, you have a continuous light source, right? Maybe we're looking at our star in this case. In red, you have a continuous light source with pulses on top of it. And so you can see just by discriminating your pulsite distributions on a single detector, you can start reading this out. You can also do fast Fourier transforms to the data and search for periodicities. So this is on the left in pink, shows both detectors multiplied by each other, their waveforms multiplied to each other. And then you just take an FFT of it and see its periodogram. And you can imagine if you do a detection threshold, you would see the periodicity for any pulses that come in. I know I'm talking to a lot of radio astronomers, but this is you know, new for the optical game in some respects. And in blue, you have the, the dark, and that's the comparison that you would look at. Okay. So target selection. We are currently defining this right now. We're using two mass and US and O catalogs to define a magnitude selection. So we're interested in two mass to get the infrared colors. We're looking at different dis distance scales, because that's of interest for these interstellar extinction reasons for going at further interstellar distances, getting spectral types and ages of stars. Um, we've even talked about selecting targets along the ecliptic. So maybe those stars know of our atmosphere because they've observed Earth's transit. Um, you know, just different fun ideas. Um, selecting bright, distant targets in the galactic plane, going very far in distance since we can. And so our team is in a lot of discussions, and I, I'm interested in hearing everybody's input on this as well. In addition, we're interested in astrophysical sources. So we can save the waveform um, and at different time bins and at different resolutions. This is interesting for looking at things like the Crab Nebulae and trying to understand the giant pulse within the Crab Nebulae. There's these large pulses that are thousands to 10,000 times brighter than typical pulses of the Crab. And trying to understand that um, is of interest. And nobody's ever done this before. So of course, we'd like to look at it. Pulsars and other variable stellar sources of our interest as well. 
So our schedule, um, our instrument has been fully assembled and it's in final integration right now at UC San Diego. And our team is working on post-processing algorithms, the things I've discussed today defining our target selection, and we're just readying the instrument to be integrated at the telescope, um, especially within software. So stay tuned. Um, in summary, so I'd like to end um, that I hope I've excited you that nanosecond near-infrared is a brand new unexplored astrophysical phase space. We've created a new near-infrared SETI instrument, um, which is economical and easy to duplicate. We've used new detectors, these discrete amplification in-gas APDs. Uh, we're going to be using one of the most sophisticated uh, post-analysis ever done for an op optical SETI search. Um, I think this will be very important for expanding uh, OSETI in general, but also for transient <coughs> sources as well. And we'll be commissioning this instrument in one month at Lick Observatory, March 12th, 13th, and 14th. Um, our team will be headed up there for a week to do integration. Um, so, as well, I think um, going back to my original message about detector development, I think the one thing I've learned from this is, you know, it's been difficult. I've probably spent about six years monitoring APDs and near infrared detectors and talking with numerous companies and going to SPI Photonics to try to understand what's available. And these detectors are moving fast. Um, and they're coming up fast, not just in the near infrared, at other wavelengths as well. And I think to have study, it's important for us to stay abreast with this technological push, to be thinking about the new search methods and new wavelengths to search at as well. So I'll end there um, showing some pictures of our, our team members at different times during this process. But um, thank you for listening. Shelley, that was a terrific talk. Um, let me start with the first question. Order of magnitude, how much does such an instrument cost? Can we get it on other telescopes? Yes. So the hardware is very cheap. And I would say most of the money that was spent on this was the labor to understand um, the detector development. But in all, it's, I would say it's of order of less than a quarter million. So questions? So uh, let's say for the sake of argument that ET is uh, on our plane of ecliptic and is firing pulsed lasers at us right now, and we start detecting them in March or April. Um, what kind of, uh, how big a laser does ET need to be using at various distances for us to detect it? So as I just said in the first, in the first slides, we can be using, so to answer your question, we're talking at petawatt at large distances. And so it's important to realize in today's technology, we would have the feasibility, if we wanted to, to transmit using our largest lasers and our largest telescopes at at least further than several thousands of light years. And so the answer to your question is, I don't know what technology they have, but if they use today's technology, they could do it. Um. So you're looking at somebody doing that, uh, say at 200 light years, how big a spread would the laser be by the time it got here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so at 200 light years, if you look at the divergence, um, it would be a, roughly about the scale of our solar system. Okay. So, so in it, 200 years, though, do we, does our solar system move enough that that attempted communication would go off to the side? No, not in that time scale, but at longer time scales it would. Um, but it's important to realize when we calculate that number of that detection, we're assuming the divergence, right? There's a numerical aperture of your laser beam spread out, spreading out as you go across interstellar distances. We assume that beam size, and then we stick our little one meter square aperture on that to do, that, do our calculations. That's how bright and phenomenally bright these lasers are. Okay, I would just like to remind myself of that too. Right, we're just, we're just like picking a little mirror off of that huge beam. Um, we heard a talk some time ago by uh, Tony Z with an idea called star tickling, where 
the energy problem of sending a signal is solved by making a star do the work and uh, putting a code sort of into the star. There are natural uh, lasers. Is there any way a, a natural laser could be tickled in the same kind of way? And, and how would you detect that? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question enough to answer that. So you mean, how would you modulate the laser signal to send a well, signal? Well, yeah, the idea would be somehow to send a beam of energy into a natural laser to somehow trigger it and amp get a huge amplification in principle of the energy and sort of use it as a, a telegraph key rather than generating the, the uh, laser light yourself. Okay. I don't know of anything, but I know that um, just to get to a little bit of your question, if we think about telecom and how we propagate signals and propagate our information, we are modulating our laser to actually propagate that signal and to get that signal sent and received. So I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not understanding, but I can talk offline. I, yeah, I think Jeff is referring to some old work by Al Betts and Charlie Towns where they postulated mirrors in a CO2 atmosphere okay. and getting multiple bounces. I see. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't either, so thank you. Let, let me just suggest to Jeff, uh, before he walks out in protest, that, you know, it's nice to use celestial lasers, but, our, our, our lasers, but after all, we've only had the laser for less than a century, and we can already do this, and then you can control the modulation. You can actually send lots of bits if you build the transmitter yourself. So I think that from the point, and, and you can aim it anywhere you want. So I think from the point of ET, uh, you know, they only have to be 100 years more advanced than we are, and this is a high school science fair project, and I think that's a lot easier than trying to get the cosmos to build your transmitter for you. Just, just a thought. Uh, what's the chance of having this uh, space-based telescope instead of Earth-based? Because wouldn't you get more signal, if it, IR signal, if it was space-based? Uh, we would love to go to space. Um, it just costs more, and so it's just a payload issue to get there. Um, we've always, one of the things we've always liked, or our team has liked about optical SETI is the, as I've said, it's economical and it's, you can duplicate it. Um, I think ultimately, when I think about if we were to go to space, it would be thinking about how to get into that five micron range and go further into the infrared. That's where you would really gain. When Towns um, in 1983 went through his discussion of backgrounds, his premise really was that all of the um, transmission and receiving was ab above the Earth's atmosphere. So if you were transmitting and you wanted to assume it went through a terrestrial atmosphere, you wouldn't go to those higher wavelengths. In fact, you would stay into the near infrared because you don't want to be opaque from the atmosphere. Yeah, very good talk, uh, K.R.S. Murthy. Um, is uh, not the telescope part, only the electronics, the detector, uh, and, and uh, infrared processing part of it. Um, is that going to be an open source if some, some different companies, different amateurs can develop something and bring it back to you as well and share in a, in a collaborative way? Is that normally what you do or you were Yeah, absolutely. At? So we, I mean, as we want it to be duplicated. So um, that the price comes down, the total yeah, absolutely. Again, That's the, idea. the majority of the price is always labor in this case. But we've chose the detectors aren't that expensive. Um, the components we purchase are not uh, that expensive. So when I, you know, I quote my cost, that has to ultimately do with your labor. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I don't see any more hands, but if you have more questions for Shelley, please come up. And Shelley, thank you so much for yes. giving us that talk today. And we have for you a special SETI talks mug and maybe that's not uh, voice communication but maybe those are lasers between oh, the two robots i love it thank you so much okay thank you it's been a pleasure. <laughs>